Greetings, nice guy Eddie back, talking weapons again. Uh, you might notice the blank spot above my head, and that's kind of cool, because tonight I am going to be talking about the katana. Um, now, depending on when you're coming into the conversation about katanas, uh, that can influence how you feel about them. There was sort of a weird uh, cycle that they went through in terms of whether or not they were really cool, really lame, uh, overrated, underrated, etc. And the, uh, my, the way that I experienced this, um, around the 2000s, uh, anime uh, kind of came a little bit more into the mainstream than it had been in the past. And with that, the idea of the katana being this really awesome sword uh, came into the, uh, the consciousness, if you will. Or at least came into my consciousness as I was seeing people talking about it on the internet, talk, hearing my friends talk about it, how they were represented in movies and whatnot. And you would think that the katana was the most amazing thing ever invented, the pinnacle of sword making, the absolute best sword that has ever been made. And that's not really true. That's mostly media and exaggeration. And what happened was around, let's say, the 2010s-ish, there began, uh, there began a, a certain trend of people sort of wanting to debunk the myth of the katana. Um, this, this was where people started to point out that, in fact, you know, it wasn't this amazingly sharp thing, that, in fact, European swords also had good edges and were, had similar cutting capacity. The fact that it wasn't a great thrusting weapon, the fact that it's, it's actually not very flexible and, and, and fairly brittle and, and, and whatnot, and debunking the myth of, of the curvature and, and all that, just a lot of different things. And they were all good points for a while, and then it seemed like it... Everybody just sort of, you know, on the internet, did what the internet does, and they jumped on the bandwagon. And so it became trendy to sort of do videos and do uh, have talks about how overrated the katana is, and then you would think that the katana was just absolute shit. That it was just the worst sword ever, and you're such a fanboy if you think it, or a weeb, or whatever, if you think it's this cool thing. And, and so the, the backlash, uh, it kind of like, again, it was responding to the katana being overrated. And then it, it, to bring it back down to reality, the backlash went too far. It, it, it got to the point now where, uh, where, where the katanas are shit, and they're the worst thing ever made, and they're such crap. And now it's almost beginning to turn around again, and, and you can sort of say katanas are actually pretty good swords. Now, how do I feel about the katana? To me, it is a good sword. Um, it is a bit of an engineering marvel, but not so much in the sword itself, so much as what the Japanese swordsmiths had to go through to create the weapon. So some of this will be, I'm just going to cover the, the manufacture of, of the katana in general, and we'll talk about this one in, in particular. Um, so you may hear things uh, about the metal being folded, and the metal is folded a million times, and that gives it incredible sharpness and strength. And first of all, I mean, I don't know if you've ever folded steel before, but you can't do anything a million times. If a guy wanted to fold steel a million times, he could have started in the Middle Ages and he'd still be doing it. Um, no, no, no. You might get, not a million, but a hundred thousand layers or something like that. If you want to know, uh, so... The reason that they fold it is because there was impurities in the Japanese steel. Uh, the European steel, the European ore, the iron ore that they made the steel from, was of better quality in terms of it having fewer impurities. The Japanese steel had more impurities, and the metal was folded during the forging process to get those impurities out and create the steel for the sword. Now, as far as a million times, you could, in theory, get a million layers. And let me, let me just show you exactly why this would be maybe what you're thinking, okay? Uh, to get a million layers, you only have to fold something 20 times. If you don't believe me, uh, you fold it once, you have two layers. You fold it twice, you have four layers. 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, round down, 500, 1,000, 2,000. 4,000, 8,000, 16,000, 32,000, 64,000, 128,000, 256,000, round down, half a million, a million. So, you fold something 20 times, you get a million layers. Katana were typically not folded 20 times, usually 8 to 16 times, but 16 folds of the metal would give you uh, about 65,000 layers of steel in there. And this was needed because of the impurities in the ore. Also, there were differences in the, and I want to get sure, make sure I say this right, the, ta, the 
Tatara furnace versus the Bloomery furnaces. The Bloomery furnaces were how the Europeans were, were uh, smelting their, their steel. Uh, the Tatara furnaces in Japan uh, would leave, again, more of the impurities in the metal that would not be, be smelted out or whatever. There was a different type of process. So what they came up with in terms of folding the metal and in terms of the differential hardening on the blade, and I'll get to that in a moment, it was actually really ingenious what they did with what they had to create a very good functional sword. I did mention about the curvature. So the curvature comes from what they call a differential hardening. I'm going to hold this a little bit closer. If you can see it, along the cutting edge of the blade, there's a little bit of a, um, I guess you might call it a discoloration. That's the haman, which forms when the metal on the cutting edge is stretched by the curvature of the blade. Now, the reason that this happens, it goes back to the type of steel that they're making these swords out of. So the edge, the cutting edge, is hardened to a really high degree. Uh, but the, the spine, the back edge, the thicker uh, blunted edge, or the mune as they call it in, in Japanese, um, this is left soft. So what you have is you have a cutting edge that is very hard and can maintain a very sharp edge, um, but when, when, when it impacts, some of that energy is absorbed by the softer metal in the thicker spine behind it. So again, it goes back to, is the sword some amazing thing, uh, it's, it's a good sword, but the engineering and the design characteristics that went into it to compensate for what they were dealing with and create a really good sword, that's what I find most impressive. So the engineering that went into the process to create the sword is amazing. The sword is just that, it's a good sword. And that's ultimately how I feel about katana. They're very good swords. There's nothing wrong with them, but there's nothing magical about them. They are not lightsabers. And in fact, when they, um, I'll get to my ex-wife in, in a moment, but uh, she was a practitioner of Iaido, and one of the things they tell the students when they're, when they're talking about edge alignment, which is very important when you're cutting with any kind of a sword, as some of you saw in the video that I did a few weeks ago where I made an absolute ass of myself trying to cut with my, uh, my arming sword down here, um, edge alignment is critical because they're not lightsabers. You have to cut correctly uh, in order to get a good cut. Um, so, uh, th by the way, the curve, you might notice it's a curved blade, and I'm not as big a fan of curved blades. I have to admit, um, European Arming Sword is kind of my jam. I like the straight blade, and I will say, if you've never held a katana before, the first couple of times you hold it, it's a little bit awkward, uh, because the center of mass is not directly out of the, uh, the hilt, um, or the, uh, hold on, let me use the correct term, the suka in this in this case, which is the hilt. It, because of the curvature of the metal, it's a little bit off. And when you first pick one up, you kind of notice it. And I especially notice it wielding it one-handed, which is not actually how you would wield a katana. Katana are, is a two-handed weapon. It is meant to be wielded two-handed. It's not as long as a European longsword, which would be used two-handed. But that is, that's uh, the longer handle on it is meant for two-handedness. And the weight of the blade really does lend itself to, uh, to two-handed wielding. And in Iaido, uh, most of the forms are, in fact, if not all of the forms are, in fact, two-handed attack forms. Now, I want to tell a little bit of a story about this sword in particular, because this is kind of funny. Um, this was actually my ex-wife's katana. This was her first sword. I mentioned, I've mentioned my ex-wife in a couple of videos. I've also mentioned uh, divorce in a video. And uh, this just goes to show, this story is going to show what I, what I mentioned a few videos ago. If you are going through a divorce, um, it will get better. Uh, it will take time, uh, but this too shall pass, and you will both be happier in the long run. Take the time you need to heal, to, but you will move on, and you'll, again, you'll both be happier in the long run. This story is kind of proof of that a little bit. So, years ago, um, probably I would say we, we, about halfway through our marriage, because we still have many years that we would be married, my wife took up, my ex-wife, wife at the time, took up Aikido and Iaido. Aikido is a martial art that involves a lot of grappling and a lot of using the momentum, the, the opponent's momentum against them, and Iaido is, as uh, stated by the bride in uh, Kill Bill, the exquisite art of the samurai sword. Um, so she, she, she actually achieved second degree black belt in Aikido and uh, second degree black belt in Toyama Ryu uh, Iaido and third degree black belt in Shinshin Ryu Iaido and she's up actually for 
uh, third degree black in Toyamaru, uh, I think in a couple of months, uh, fairly soon, fairly, fairly uh, this year, later this year sometime. Uh, COVID screwed up the timing on it a little bit. Uh, in any case, when she first started out in Iaido, she had to get a sword uh, for cutting to, 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 to learn how to cut. She had the boken, she had the wooden sword, she had the Iaito, which is a blunt sword. That's for Kumatachi, for basically person-to-person uh, -person sparring, not at full speed, more of a, this is how we, you know, we go through the motions of, you know, I, I can't do it, of course, I'm not trained. But uh, that would be where, where you're going through the, the kata, essentially, with the sword and another person. You would use a blunt sword for that. Uh, but when it came to cutting, of course, you need to have a sharp sword. And if you've ever shopped for katana, you can spend thousands on a really high-end, well, any kind of a high-end sword, but particularly a high-end katana. And she was just starting out, so she didn't know if this was something she wanted to stick with. We, we didn't have a lot of money at the time, so... She was told by the students in her class to look into Paul Chen. He was a maker of katana. He makes them out of China and markets them through the Hanwei Company. Hanwei, I've got a couple of other swords from Hanwei. Uh, the back sword, the scimitar, uh, those are Hanwei swords. Very happy with them. Be talking about more Hanwei swords. One of the things about Hanwei swords is that they generally have a good or decent, but not very good, great, or excellent edge. Um, they're not generally really cutting sharp swords, although they generally do have good edge profiles that can be sharpened and done up very nicely. But the Paul Chen Katana, uh, in the two to three hundred dollar range, had a reputation for being good, simple, functional swords. The Suba is not particularly decorative. The Suka is, you know, fairly simple. I mean, not a lot of ornamentation or anything like that. But it was a good, functional cutting sword. That's what she was sold on. So she ordered the sword, like I said, two to $300 range, which is really kind of the baseline that you can really pay for anything worthwhile. But she was told by the other students that this would be a good cutting sword. So she gets it, and, you know, she's, uh, she's going, I, I'm not, she doesn't look like me, she's actually doing well, except that she's having trouble cutting tatami mats. It's just not working out for her can't figure out what she's doing, and I mean, months are going by. Now, you saw you saw me in the backyard not too long ago. Like I said, it's harder than it looks, but this is, she's being trained, and months are going by, and she's getting very frustrated, and she's about to the point where she's just ready to quit because she's just not making any progress. When the sensei comes to her in class one night and says, hang on a second, um, try my sword. Hands her a sword that was a different length and a different weight and balanced slightly differently and I mean you know again the whole point of, of this kind of training is the repetitive exact precise motion and to, to, to be given another sword even if it's a better sword you're not necessarily that much better off because you, she's never held this sword before let alone swung it try to cut with it but she tries it with his sword first try right through and he says hang on a second let me try yours so he takes this sword Hack! <laughs> Three quarters of the way through, couldn't get through it. So it was one of those rare times, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, put it into the Sama, which is the, uh, the scabbard. It was one of those rare times that it was in fact the weapon, not the warrior. Now, she came home that night absolutely pissed off. Uh, she was so frustrated. This had been going on for so long that she came back home ready to just chuck this thing in the garbage. She just wanted to throw it down the street and run over it with her car and kick it and, and, and melt it down and make coins out of it. I don't know. She was just so angry at this sword. Now, she was literally going to throw it away. She was going to throw it in the garbage. Um, which is, in spite of how I treated the very first sword I ever owned, in the very first video I ever did, to my lasting shame, it's kind of against my religion to destroy a weapon and throw it away. So, I kind of talked her off the ledge, said, it's okay, it's okay honey, we'll, we'll get another sword, you know, you'll get, you know, you obviously are interested in this, you're, we'll get you a good sword, but don't throw this one away. I mean, you don't have to keep it, but I like swords, I have a collection, why don't you, I'll just put it in my collection, you know. And she's like, all right, fine, take it. I never want to see it again. So it became part of my collection. Now I've mentioned a couple times we're getting divorced. So fast forward a couple of years, and we are going through what is 
arguably one of the most amicable, amicable divorces in history. We really didn't have anything that was in dispute. We sort of knew uh, each other, and we knew what we had, and we, we kind of had a good... We were on the same page for how things were going to be done, how the ch parenting and the kids, how that was going to happen, what we are going to do with the houses, what we are going to do with our assets, even going through in the furniture, and it's like, okay, uh, she wanted the bed, and I'll take the bedroom set, and she wants the green couch, and I'll take the black couch. It was really easy. The sole point of contention came up when she said, uh, we were just dividing up our stuff, and she says, hmm, you know that, um, do you remember that, uh, that, that sword I, I gave you a few years ago? From my cold, dead hands. And she was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so consequently, that is how her sword became my sword. She was ready to throw it away, and I, um, I got it in the divorce. <laughs> so it actually, I, I, she had agreed to give it to me, and I did not agree to give it back when we got divorced. Hey, if it weren't for me, she wouldn't have had the sword. Would not even be in the conversation. That was my sword. I saved it, mine. <laughs> so it stayed in my collection. Let me tell you a little bit about the Paul Chan sword. So, tail of the tape. Uh, overall weight of the sword, 2 pounds, 6 ounces, so just a little bit more than the arming sword. Uh, overall blade length, 27 inches. This includes, uh, this is everything above the habaki. There's about a little 1 inch uh, blade color down here called a habaki. Um, overall length, 40 inches, like I said, 27 inch blade. And the point of balance is about, you can't really balance it, there we go. It's about, right about there, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm close, there you go. Right about there, it's about five inches above um, sort of the uh, the bottom of the suba. That's about an inch farther out than what it was on the arming sword, that was four inches. It consequently, between the weight and the slightly further balance point, and the fact that um, there really is no weighted pommel on the back of Japanese swords. Um, the, the suka ito or the cord wrap uh, basically just goes down and they put a cap over it, but there's no no counterweight to it. Uh, hence why one-handed, it is a bit. It's not what I would call lively. Two-handed, you get a nice um, you get a nice motion out of it, the, and and that, that having the weight a little bit further down the blade, having a little more blade weight to work with, makes for a, a, an excellent chopping or cutting uh, a, a slashing type action. Uh, I did mention that the Hanwei swords are notorious for having decent but not great edges. Um, this one, um, I mean, just to give you an idea, again, I've done this demonstration a couple times with the other swords, but just to show you, okay, so even though she was having trouble cutting to Tommy Mass with this, it does cut. It is sharp. I wouldn't want to, you know, catch it to the face or have it come down on my uh, soft bits anywhere. That being said, again, uh, when it comes to cutting, when it comes to swords in general, they are far more dangerous in the hands of somebody who is trained on how to wield them properly. So this sword in my hands versus this sword in her hands, two very different situations. Even though, yes, the edge on it is very sharp. And by the way, the, the, it, it was that sharp. This has never been sharp and this has never been maintained or anything like that. She cut with a few, or failed to cut with it a few times in class, and then it's hung on the wall ever since. So, you know, as you can see, the, there is a decent edge on it. And the Paul Chen swords in particular uh, have a reputation as cutting swords that maybe some of the other pieces in the Hanway collection don't have. As for the construction, I mean, again, it's it's very simple. Uh, you can, like I said, this was in the two to three hundred dollar range. Uh, if you go to Paul Chen's website, you uh, look up Paul Chen. I don't even have the exact. Uh, I'll put it down there. Um, he still sells swords through the Hanway Company. Um, a lot of different varieties. I don't believe the one with this exact suba is is still available. They're a little bit more decorative nowadays. But overall, it's a very nice, simple sword. Very traditional construction. Uh, the uh, Suka Ito, the cord wrap, is really solid. Um, you know, it's not loose at all. Blade is in, is is you know well uh, well constructed. Uh, really, the only thing uh, that they went cheap on would be the Sama, with the Same, sorry, the Same, which is this white portion that you can see below the cord wrap. Now, on a traditional sword, that would be made out of ray skin. 
uh, to give it a little bit of a cushion, a little extra cushion. On these, it's just textured plastic. Uh, so that's one where, and that's a fairly common substitution that's made these days. But yeah, this is just textured plastic. It's not ray skin. Um, but if you're going to go cheap on something, something that's sort of inside and you don't really see it all that much, and I mean, the, the, the feel of the handle is not really affected by it so much. So overall, I would say for the money, I do recommend Paul Chen Katana, but be aware you might get one <laughs> that doesn't cut as well as you expect if you're, if you're um, just starting out. Um, so anyway, that's the, uh, that's the story of the Paul Chen Katana. It's the story of how I acquired it. I do recommend Paul Chen uh, in the price range. They're decent Katana. If you're thinking of getting one, don't go on Wish.com and buy an $80 wall hanger, something dangerous. Um, you know, I de re spend two to three hundred bucks, get a Paul Chen, uh, or, you know, if you can do better, great. But I, I would definitely say as a known entity, uh, you know, they did a good job with this one. Uh, cutting edge, mm, okay, but I'm not out cutting tatami mats, as you saw. Whoa! I'm guessing that was just the most awkward cut in a video full of awkward cuts. I'm guessing all the weapons from your perspective just shifted a few inches. The shadows are all different. I'm 10 pounds lighter, and for some reason, I got all this red puffy shit going on in my eyes right now, which is really inconvenient. <laughs> yes, it's time for reshoots. I have to do reshoots. So what happened is... Uh, several times throughout this video, uh, the way it was originally shot, I was teasing this great thing where my ex-wife was going to actually demonstrate that katana, which is now hanging up on the wall, continuity error. Um, she was going to come back and uh, I actually asked her if she'd be interested in cutting for the video. And she said, yeah, that sounds like that would be an interesting challenge. You know, she, she's a much better cutter, uh, swords, sword wielder, if you will, than she was years ago. So she was interested in coming back. Unfortunately, uh, that all fell through. We just couldn't get our schedules to sync up, and she had to deal with some family stuff, and I was trying to sell my house. I'm, that's a long story that I'm not going to get into. And um, consequently, th this video has dragged on for like a month. Yes, a month has gone by from the time I shot everything to what I'm doing right now. And the problem was I didn't have an ending for it because I ended up by saying, and now we're going to sh go outside and see your cut. And I never recorded an ending. So really awkward. I apologize. Totally unprofessional. Hopefully you found that amusing. But in any case, if you're finding these videos interesting, please like and subscribe. And uh, I hope to see you next week when we will be talking about another piece from Hanway, this uh, basket-hilted backsword. Until then, take care.